footage is available on our podcast channel. Uh, that is at youtube.com and then search Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Back to uh, join us to lead off this week's program, President of the National Right to Work Foundation, uh, online at nrtw.org, is Mark Mix. Mark, welcome back to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, Joe. Thanks for the opportunity to be on with you again. I was mentioning this, and we were talking to John Burlow, uh, who, by the way, uh, was on when his book, uh, Washington Entrepreneur, came out. And you can find it in our archives. But we were talking about the uh, the Constitutional Convention and how uh, the Federalists had an overwhelming number of seats, yet they still reached out to the minority parties to make sure that there, were, there wasn't going to be factionalism. They weren't going to have states like New York calling for another constitutional uh, convention. And I said, well, yeah, what a what a time that must have been where even a party see now we live in a world where a party has a one seat majority they gerrymander the committees to be 13 to 5 ramrod everything they want as if you know their house is on fire and they have to catch a train uh, and there is no idea that there might be another point of view on anything and we're seeing some of the same stuff coming from the U.S. House of Representatives despite the Democrats nearly losing their majority they're out there pushing things like Bobby Scott's PRO Act, Mark. Uh, I thought that had uh, kind of passed away with the last Congress. <laughs> yeah, Joe, it's interesting. You know, I'll quote the uh, the former President Barack Obama when he said elections have consequences. And, yeah, yeah, and what he meant by that was they were going to exercise power. And uh, unlike our founding fathers and unlike... Uh, the, although the decorum, I suspect, in those uh, those gatherings was probably heated as well. But at least, to your point, Joe, that the minority had a voice. And that's the whole idea of this constitutional republic that we have. I mean, first of all, there are certain things that should never be subject to a vote. But secondly, uh, it is the idea that, you know, in self-government, this experiment of self-government, there the voices can be raised. And, and frankly, in the United States Senate, that was kind of the design of the extended debate and some of the rules that have been promulgated there to make sure that the minority has a voice as opposed to just running over them like we're doing here in the United States House of Representatives with Bobby Scott's bill to literally repeal Virginia's right to work law by federal decree. Uh, Bobby Scott and 199 of his friends in Congress have sponsored a bill that would that would basically do what Lee Carter, the representative from Manassas Park in the Virginia House of Delegates, has tried to do for the last couple of years, and that's repeal Virginia's right to work law and allow union officials to have workers fired if they simply don't pay dues or fees to get or keep their jobs. It really is kind of outrageous. Well, and talk about that a little bit because, you know, to me, A, it's an offense on states' rights. Um, and if a state doesn't want to have right to work, that's their choice, and, and they can compete with those of us that do. And we've talked plenty of times in the past, Mark. It's one of the driving factors to where even with eight years of Terry McAuliffe and uh, Ralph Northam, we're still okay when it comes to rankings in the United States for states to do business. Yeah, indeed, Joe. But, you know, it's interesting because the, 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 the power, the privilege of a, of a state to pass a right-to-work law, and you won't be surprised by this, Joe, is actually a privilege granted by the federal government when they usurped labor management relations back in the 1930s. Uh, back in the Roosevelt years, when they initially tried to pass the National Industrial Recovery Act that was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court because it was a federal uh, grab of, of labor management relations of the states, and frankly, there was a Tenth Amendment argument that was being made, but Franklin Roosevelt took care of it. He went over and visited the folks at the Supreme Court building and said, look, if you don't approve what I'm doing here and what I'm trying to do to bring the quote-unquote country back, I'm using my finger quotes here, Joe, then, uh, then we need to... to add additional six members to the uh, Supreme Court because mm -hmm. these guys, you know, you guys are all getting old and anyone over 70 would get an associate justice. That would have taken the court to 15. And at that point, the switch in time saved nine, interestingly enough, and they ruled the Wagner Act constitutional. And that was what gave the federal government power over the states when it came to labor management relations. And so for the next 12 years, unions, union officials used this power to grow dramatically. In 1947, they said, well, We've probably gone too far. We've given them too much power. And so they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which basically granted the states the privilege. And, I, and again, it's, it is a privilege. The states that or the federal government said you can, mm -hmm. if by affirmative vote, 
You can outlaw the closed shop. You can have a right to work law. So in Bobby Scott's bill, all she's doing is going back into the federal law and repealing that section, section 14B, that says states no longer have the privilege of doing it. And the forced unionism imposed by the federal government will blanket the country once again. Well, let, let's let's talk about this because unions, and it seems like the longer I walk the earth, the less it seems like unions make any sense to the average American. We see their enrollment dropping except where they're conscripted by the government to have to uh, enroll. And when given a choice, a lot of Americans are saying, um, I don't know what you're doing for me because it sure doesn't seem like what I want done for me. Yeah, that's exactly right, Joe. And there's a couple of really, really, really recent examples of that that I can talk about for a minute. But first, let's recognize that as of 2020, there are more government union members in America than there are private sector union members. The private sector union membership is about 6.3% of the private sector workforce. The, on the government side of the house, it's you know up in the 30s, mid-30s, 35, mm-hmm. 36. But there are actually literally more union members, the actual physical numbers of union members in the public sector, in the government sector, than there is in the private sector. And to your point about representation, let's talk about the pipe fitters and steam fitters and the operating engineers and, and the building trades that were working on the Keystone pipeline that are now on the unemployment line right. <laughs> because a president that their union endorsed for office signed an order that withdrew the permit to have the Keystone Pipeline built. And literally thousands of union workers are out of work because of that action. I mean, if you're asking a question about what your union official is doing for you, you're now asking that from the unemployment office in your particular state. Holy Jimmy Hoffa, Batman, and and of course, <laughs> the, you know that that fuel, that oil from Canada has to go into uh, trains uh, that, uh, for the most part, are owned by Berkshire Hathaway or into trucks driven by AFL CIO. So it just seems like you know one union over another uh, has uh, won the day. Uh, how, and and I guess that's the bigger problem is that it's a derby to see which union has the most political clout to get the uh, largesse from the federal uh, underwriters. Exactly. You you just nailed it, Joe. The the idea that their focus, union officials' focus, is not on the workers they claim to represent, but on government power. You know, when they went to the Congress back in the 1930s, they were warned by then father of the American labor movement, Samuel Gompers, that if they went to government for their power, they be, they would become wards of the government. And their power is a, is a result of government action, not of the services they provide to workers, not of the the representation that they provide to workers, but their ability ability to go to government and say, give us this power. And Joe, it used to be that, you know, these unions had jurisdictional fences around, you know, teamsters were truck drivers and steel workers were steel workers and, mm-hmm. and the building trades. Now it's, you know, it's no surprise to go into the state and see that the United Auto Workers is representing uh, nurses in government hospitals. Well, and, and look at, I mean, they want to unionize fast food restaurants, uh, Mark. It's it's an amazing place. Uh, and I guess that's a world where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can say, I think we talked about it last time, that working for Amazon is akin to working, you know, on a plantation as a slave. I'm like, well, hang on a second. I don't see how that works. But it's the it's this populist thuggery that they, uh, they, they minimize enthusiasm, they minimize industry, lowercase i industry, uh, and and it seems like we have just gone into what I call almost a soft core fascism, where the government doesn't necessarily partner with the means of product, production, take over half of it, but with their permit class, they, they, they have become, without having to pay any money or take any responsibility, they, they've just become the overriders of all of these businesses, and everyone just wants the government to help them out. Yeah, indeed. And, and from a union, a union boss perspective, the idea that you can get a, a law that allows you to collect money from workers as a privilege of working in America or a right to work in America, that's a pretty good business proposition, Joe. I mean, I, I wish that everyone would listen to your radio station, but you can't compel them. Right. Interestingly enough, if you could, the advertisers would really, really love you, wouldn't they? I mean, if everyone had to listen to Joe Thomas, which they should if they don't, but we can't compel them. But union officials have that power, and that makes for a pretty interesting business model. You know, you just get the money no matter what you do. Mm. And the Keystone Pipeline is a perfect example of that playing out in real time. Mark Mix is on with us, president of the National Right to Work Foundation. Find his uh, work and all of his organization's work at nrtw.org. Mark, you you mentioned the Keystone Pipeline. Do you 
and, and Gomper's statement about becoming wards of the state, the power of the union movement, and I go back to the early 1900s, and we were, you know, the, the, the globe was dealing with this industry, this economic structure that was, uh, you know, all of a sudden, instead of farms, we were working in factories, and how do we manage that, and what are the authorities, and who has uh, final say, and, you know, here in the United States, we saw the union movement build up, whereas in Europe, it was the communist movement uh, build up, and funny enough, it was the unions that beat back communism in Poland, uh, finally, because they wanted the independence to stand up for the individual workers. When did we lose that? Was it money? Was it access? Uh, is it just some of our weakest, you know, biggest parts of our human weaknesses, sloth, envy, jealousy, Mark? Well, I think that's uh, that's a little deeper. That's a deep end of the pool discussion when you get into those attributes, Joe. But the bottom line is, when when the federal government took over labor management relations, you created this one size fits all, and it came with an overlay of compulsion and coercion and force. And as it manifests itself through the process, that's exactly what's happened. And, you know, Gomper said the workers of America adhere to voluntary institutions, and anything else is a menace to their rights. And we'll destroy that which brought together voluntarily is invincible. That's a, a pretty quotes, uh, uh, close paraphrase of what Gompers was saying when he found out that the delegates of the AFL wanted to go to government for this power. But prior to 1935, Unionism was completely voluntary, and they were a growing power. And today, today, notwithstanding Bobby Scott's bill, our congressman from mm -hmm. Virginia, workers' rights to organize are protected by not only federal law, but state law. And this notion that somehow workers can't join together to amplify their voice is ridiculous. They can, and they do. And if an employer is mistreating their employees, generally they get unionized, or mm -hmm. there's a threat to be unionized, and things change. That's how it works. But yet we have granted a private organization a monopoly over workers, both in the public sector now and a growing uh, uh, scope of that here in Virginia with the last legislative session. We are now going to give union officials additional power and formal power and prioritize their power over taxpayers here in the Commonwealth of Virginia starting May 1st with a bill that will allow unions to organize government employees here in the Commonwealth. And it will start that process that we've seen in California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, all these economic basket cases that mm. ideally won't be, won't be basket cases anymore now that Joe Biden's going to bail them out for all this mismanagement. But yeah. here's what we're starting in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yeah, we're all going to be in the basket uh, then, Mark. <laughs> but you know, the unions, and my father-in-law, love him dearly, was a union founder, uh, founded a machinist union, Long Island, uh, but founded it for the right reasons. Saw the employees were being ripped off by uh, people pretending to be their uh, union shop steward. Uh, the company wasn't even the one that was fighting with them. Com competition amongst unions. Uh, when, when I listen to uh, automaker unions say, well, Oh, we'll strike against Ford, uh, and and their contract is up at a different point than the GM contract is up. And that ability to go from one union to another, the same way you used to be able to go from one employer to another, is what drives American exceptionalism. And, and maybe that's what's happened: is the unions have driven out any of their competition either. Well, I think that's right. They've become a large monolithic block. And, and unfortunately, to your earlier point, Joe, there's a scramble for revenue. They're a business, too. Uh, unions are businesses, and their, their revenue is union dues money. And whether they get it by compulsion or force or whether they get it voluntarily, that's their stock and trade is union dues. And so this idea that, you know, the United Auto Workers, who have, I think, 12 of their top executives in jail are either waiting to be sentenced to go to jail for extorting and stealing money from rank-and-file workers across the nation. Mm -hmm. um, they're out there looking for nurses and teachers and bus drivers and, and anybody they can, they can uh, coerce into a union monopoly or convince to join a union monopoly voluntarily. They're looking for dues revenue. So you have that competition, exactly. And, and uh but that competition is is guided by an overarching AFL-CIO that has, I think, what, 55 now or 54 subsidiary unions under one big umbrella, and it's this monopoly, and that's how they're that's how they operate. And and again, their their privilege and their power is that it's a direct result of government action. That's why they have to play politics the way they do. They are one of the biggest players on the political stage, uh, literally spending billions of dollars to protect mm -hmm. their power or to expand their power. And we're seeing that with this new administration in spades. 
Well, you, certainly we heard, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the union chief that was very, you know, backhandedly critical of Joe Biden uh, and Pete Buttigieg for their behavior regarding the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and uh, we'll see what comes of that, but I can't see them leaving, though. they The unions seemed very, very fond of Donald Trump. Uh, so I don't understand how that happened unless the money is just that good, Mark. Yeah. Well, the rank and file certainly did. And and President Trump attracted the votes of rank and file workers across this country, union and non-union workers and and blue collar workers. And and not that that's even a proper designation. I mean, workers across America embraced his his agenda. His agenda, there was a study just recently released about reshoring industries over the last decade. And it's interesting because that that massive reshoring of manufacturing jobs, those high paid uh, manufacturing jobs that, that are, you know, that build the middle class, those 69% of those jobs that came back to America during that decade came to right to work states. And the fact is, if Bobby Scott and the rest of the United States, 200 and 199 of his colleagues in Congress and Lee Carter and Virginia want to, want to basically say, we're going to repeal right to work laws, we're going to restore forced unionism in America, and you're going to watch jobs head back overseas again. And I think mm-hmm. this administration, you know, they want to build America, but now they've, I think they just did an executive order, Joe, that said, you know, an American contractor can be someone we have a trade agreement with. And if you read in the fine print, you know who that is. That's China. Yeah. And frankly, you know, our jobs are going to be heading back overseas again, unfortunately. And mm. union officials are going to bless that through their support <laughs> of this administration because the administration supports their compulsion. It's it's amazing how it works. And, ama- you know, amazingly, the unions have become the very thing they were founded to fight against. Uh, that's the part I think you you and I have talked about that, Mark. Tell us about uh, HB 1755. Uh, it, it, I understand it didn't get out of the committee um, by an 8315 vote this year, but it's uh, Lee Carter along with uh, Sally Hudson from our Charlottesville flagship area and uh, everybody's favorite gun grabber, Mark Levine, uh, all co-sponsoring this uh, bill to repeal right to work. Yeah, the bill HB 1755 was introduced by Lee Carter, and it was basically the straight-out repeal of right to work, saying that workers in Virginia would be forced to pay union dues or fees to work. And the bill uh, got into committee. It didn't get out of committee, so <clears throat> Delegate Carter decided that he was going to try to buck the leadership and, and do what we call in the business a blast motion. He basically put a motion onto the floor of the House of Delegates in, in the full session, in the plenary session, saying, I want this bill out of committee. <clears throat> and he got 12 votes. They got 13 votes to pull it out of committee. But I think what that signals, Joe, and, and, and you know this, that politicians, if they can get it done secretly, they'll be glad to do it. But when you have to stand in the public light, in the sunshine of transparency, and say that we want the workers of the Commonwealth of Virginia to pay union dues to get or keep a job, they know politically, as we're going into the elections here coming up in November, that's not really a very palatable position to take. And I think Virginia citizens would understand that. That's why they wanted to kill the bill. And it didn't make the crossover date, which is the date where bills must that have been introduced in one house must make it out of committee and pass over or they die. Hey, Mark makes National Right to Work Foundation. Please join in with them uh, and and help out their efforts all the time, anytime and twice on Tuesday. Uh, it is uh, NT, NRTW. Dot org. Thank you for everything you do, and thanks for visiting us again here on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. My privilege, Joe, and thank you for, for your voice and for your voice about uh, common sense and freedom in, in the Commonwealth. I really appreciate it. Yeah, go figure. That that might be a winning combination. Who, who needs the compulsion to listen, right? Thank you, sir. You have a great weekend. You too, Joe.